Okay, today I wanted to talk a little bit about um, PPI and what settings we have available and their impacts on the cutting and why they have those impacts. Um, so help China elucidate how to set the PPI so that you get uh, good results, okay? So first, we need to understand what settings we have available to us um, and then try and do some calculations to um, show what those impacts are, okay? So the first uh, setting that we have available to us is all, uh, the, the pulse width in uh, milliseconds, okay? In general, you want to try and keep this pulse width um, to a minimum, um, with the exception of trying to cut very thick materials. You may want to increase your pulse width um, and trade that for a uh, decreased feed rate uh, to get uh, more energy per pulse. But we'll talk about that soon. Okay, the second setting is uh, PPI or pulses per inch. Okay, the third is the feed rate that we're going at. Uh, the fourth is uh, the power setting, basically the little knob on the laser and or the um, pulse width modulated signal that you send to the uh, laser power supply. Um, and then this is kind of a placeholder because um, I don't really know what this value is, but I'm um, assuming that it's going to be somewhere around 40 watts um, average power. Of course, you know that if we as I showed in the blog, that this could actually be significantly higher with a three millisecond pulse, but I need a value to actually do the calculations to show what the relationships are. So um, these I can have hard numbers on. This is kind of a guess, and you'll see where that comes out in a minute. So now to talk about calculations and to start to understand what's going on, uh, the first thing I did was convert it to millimeters. Um, uh, the PPI, so now this is pulses per per millimeter. The second thing, um, then you want to multiply your uh, pulses per millimeter by the feed rate uh, to get uh, the pulse duration, or the duration, not pulse duration, but the duration between pulses, or how many pulses there are per second. And then the period between the pulses expressed in milliseconds is just the inverse times a thousand. Okay, so now we can calculate the duty cycle um, of the laser, um, and the way to do that then is to take the pulse period, I'm sorry, the pulse width divide by the pulse period, and then multiply by the power setting, and that actually gives you the fraction of that uh, 40 watts that is actually being used over time. It's kind of a anecdotal way of, of, of uh, showing that, that you are reducing the total power to the material. Um, <clears throat> and the only way you're going to get to 100% is to really increase this to the same value as your pulse period or more. Um, it's not going to get you any more than 100%, but if you set the pulse width to more than this pulse period, it's going to be on continually. And that's going to be the same as having a straight up on off control like uh, we typically have with um, without PPI. Okay, so now if, if we estimate this value and this actually can be measured but I don't have the equipment to do that um, I would need one of those high-speed photospectrometers that uh, that uh, um, full spectrum engineering used and integrate the power pulse in order to get this value, but it's going to be somewhere close to 40 to 80 watts, somewhere in that range. Um, so this is simply the average power times the time in seconds, so milliseconds times a th uh, divided by a thousand gives us uh, seconds, um, times the average power setting um, so this is in, in fractions, so 100 divided by 100. Um, so this is 1, and that actually comes out to joules per pulse. Um, now this, this is what really determines your, uh, shall I say, drill depth of the laser. 
Um, so each pulse will go a certain depth based on the energy that you're supplying it. Um, and you'll find that uh, that this in combination with the PPI setting as in the density of those dots will give you something that I call the cut energy density which is expressed in terms of energy per millimeters cut and that is simply the pulse the joules per pulse times the pulses per millimeter okay so when these when these pulses start to overlap you can actually cut deeper than you would get with a uh, single pulse um, <clears throat> but th and that's just because you're starting to to get uh, overlapping power density okay so this this is really the number that's going to affect how deep you can cut with uh, PPI okay now the second thing that you have to be concerned about is the uh, actual power that you're putting into the material um, this is important because there's only um, I, I'll, I'll say it this way when you make a cut, um, the majority of the energy is going into vaporizing the material and clearing it to make the kerf. Okay, but the remainder of that energy um, gets absorbed. Most of it gets absorbed by the material on either side of the kerf. Okay, and the material that you're cutting has a lot to do with how fast you can go and how much power it can handle, because uh, you know, every material has a specific heat. It has, you know, something like a melting point or, or um, you know, a, uh, um, uh, what do they call that, where it starts to burn um, in oxygen, um, like with woods and stuff like that. <clears throat> and it also has a certain thermal conductivity. So the more power that you put into the material, uh, the higher the temperature is going to be on either side of the cut <clears throat> and the thermal conductivity of the material determines the rate at which that energy can be dissipated away from the cut okay so this is what's going to determine a uh, uh, be a big quality um, determining factor in uh, the kind of cut you get and uh, to kind of elucidate that a little further I have two examples of materials that I've cut um, and all I've done is changed the um, the feed rate so if I go ahead and set that to 100 you can see that my cut energy density didn't change because that's only related to the PPI um, the power setting and um, the average power per pulse really um, and, the, and um, yeah that's basically all it's related to but my power to deliver to the material increased it, it doubled so if I went back to 50 now yeah, it's about 4.7 if I go to 100 that's uh, you know just about nine and a half and that makes a big impact on um, the quality of the cut um, and to show that I'm gonna show some sorry for the uh, poor camera work here but uh, I have two pieces of acrylic that I've cut um, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. This camera does not do good with um, with closer up images but you'll have to just trust my description here. Okay, So this piece um, was cut at 100 millimeters a second with these with these settings, those, those same settings. Okay, And you can see that the corners, well first off you can see that the, the, the straight parts are nice and clear they're almost perfectly flame polished and smooth which is what we really want out of a good cut I've got to say this was done in one one single pass okay but the corners, I don't know if you can see that a little bit better if I hold a little farther away it might be in better focus but you can see that there's that white part there on the corner and that is um, bubbling and melting of the material um, and if I reduce the feed rate I still got the, uh, roughly the same result on the linear portion but the edges look much 
much cleaner. The corners here look much cleaner. Okay, so <clears throat> the reason for that is not the fault really of you know failure of a PPI, but it is a material property. And what I'm doing is distributing this power to the material throughout the volume of the cut. Now, if I if I look at the piece here, you can see that at the corners, if I go in its constant velocity and have constant power, and I bend around that corner right there, then the volumetric power density right near the material corner is very high. Okay, um, and that's why. I got poor results on the corners with, with the higher feed rates. So how do you avoid that? Well, one of the ways, uh, since I, I can change my feed rate and my cut depth, um, my linear uh, cut energy density doesn't change, I can slow down my cuts in the corners via acceleration settings in my control. So I'm going to try that, and I'll post some results um, here in a little bit. Um, but if I'm right about this, I should be able to significantly improve the cut around the corner um, with that. So, um, so now let's talk about, you know, how would you find the right settings for uh, your material, okay? So in general, uh, what I would do... Um, is set this to 400 ppi, feed rate of 400, 100% power, okay? Um, and I do, I do a test cut, okay? So the, uh, the first thing that I check to, is to make sure that I'm getting a good, clean, like I'm actually cutting through the material. If I'm not, then what I'll do is I'll double this ppi setting, sorry, 800, and half this, okay? So you can see then that my power delivered to the material is the same, but now I have doubled the cut energy density, which makes it cut deeper, okay? So now, if I have the uh, cut energy density set right, but I'm getting melting at the corners, I can um, either adjust my acceleration or I can set my, my uh, material feed rate, uh, sorry, the, the head feed rate, lower even still. And you can see that that keeps the cut energy density the same, which keeps my depth of cut relatively the same, but it cuts my power to the material, okay? Um, then the third factor is if my edges don't look flame polished enough, um, I can uh, increase my PPI and what I, what I would do again is double my, my uh, PPI and half my feed rate. Um, and that keeps my, my power to the material uh, roughly the same, but it increases my uh, cuts per inch. And uh, if, you, if you're concerned about getting the cut energy density too high as in you're going to cut too deep into a material if you wanted to set a depth of cut for some reason what you would have to do then is lower your power setting um, in proportion so that you keep the cut energy density the same but you've got to realize that that's going to cut the power to your material too so <clears throat> they're intertwined you can control uh, the cut uh, very well um, uh, without controlling the acceleration into the uh, uh, corners, what you're going to have to do is um, set your um, you're going to have to set your feed rate uh, the, yeah, without controlling acceleration, you're going to have to set your feed rate to the feed rate that is the maximum that gets you good results on the corners of your material. Um, and I'm going to try and work out the math and theory behind uh, what it would take to do the acceleration to get you uh, reasonable feed rates on the linear um, or you know gently curving pieces that would also give you good results on the um, 
on sharp corners so that you don't end up uh, bubbling out those materials. Um, I'm not sure if I said this or not, but um, sometimes that can actually even ruin your, your piece because when it starts to bubble like that, it actually bubbles across the kerf and refuses to itself and um, it can the, the, the piece sticks in, um, in, in the kerf and um, I've actually broken a few of my acrylic pieces trying to get it out um, and so uh, I guess the long and the short of it is uh, PPI is very very useful for being able to uh, control uh, the power to the material and the cut energy density so you can fiddle with your cut depth and cut quality um, fairly easily and this is just uh, a phenomenal improvement in cutting uh, over uh, strictly on off control. Um, I, I tried very hard uh, with the uh, on off controls using quarter inch acrylics um, and I could not get single pass uh, cut results that were anywhere close to the cut quality. Um, the edges didn't look as smooth and uh, my corner quality was terrible unless I, I went very fast um, and uh, did a lot of passes, uh, neither, which, neither one of which is uh, really highly, highly desirable for accurate uh, part making. Um, so anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed this and I hope this helps you understand PPI and why it's so useful. Um, so if you have questions, uh, feel free to contact me.